Hi guys, my name is Carlos Restrepo, and this is... Hi guys, so welcome to Classical Conditioning Episode 2. So in this episode, we will be talking about self-regulation. So you may be asking yourself, well, Carlos, what is self-regulation? So self-regulation is really about preserving homeostasis. So then that brings on the next question, what is homeostasis? Well, homeostasis is really about balance and maintenance. Now, if we're able to look at the human body like a machine or an instrument, uh, machines or instruments require a certain level of balance and maintenance in order to perform at the highest level. And human beings also require the same thing. So the cool thing about self-regulation is that it talks about balance and maintenance, not just with regards to physiology, but also with regards to psychology. So it is a very holistic subject. Um, with that in mind, our guest is Dr. Stuart Schenker, a self-regulation expert. He's a distinguished research professor emeritus of philosophy and psychology at York University. He's the founder and CEO of the Merit Center, a self-regulation learning and information center. He's an acclaimed author and international speaker. His latest book, Self-Rig, How to Help Your Child and You Break the Stress Cycle and Successfully Engage with Life has gathered enthusiastic reviews and media attention throughout North America. It has been published in the UK, the US, South Korea, the Netherlands, and the Czech Republic with further foreign editions in the works. So I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get this episode going, I would like to give a quick shout out to two people, one being Colleen Dickinson. Thank you so much for helping me with the logistics in terms of getting this interview to happen. Number two, my friend, training partner and Filipino brother from another mother, Alexis Cruz. Thank you so much for taking the time to come up to me and talk to me and give me this textbook on self-regulation. If it wasn't for you, um, the inspiration for this episode uh, wouldn't have occurred and I wouldn't be educated in terms of this topic. So thank you for taking the time and uh, I can't wait to train with you soon, man. Thank you for those of you tuning in. Interview begins now. I would like to welcome you guys to uh, Dr. Stuart Shanker. Dr. Stuart Shanker. Carlos. Awesome to meet you. Um, so, uh, let's get this thing going. Okay, go for it. Um, so, Stuart, what is self regulation, dysregulation, and the primary areas of stress that we should be aware of? Okay, so lots of questions there. Um, self regulation is one of the oldest things that we've studied in psychology. It goes back to the middle of the 19th century. And it was rediscovered uh, around the beginning of the 20th century by an American called Walter Cannon. And originally, what they were looking at was something called homeostasis. So to understand self-regulation, you have to understand homeostasis. And all homeostasis means is that everything in nature, including us, operates within a sort of healthy, functional range. And you can think of it like a furnace. So if you set your furnace at uh, 20 degrees, uh, and the thermostat keeps the system within a range of from 17 degrees up to 22, 23. And so self-regulation, what we think of is how the furnace works if, say, it gets cold out. Something kicks on, it burns some fuel to keep you in that healthy range. There are all different kinds of ways of self-regulating, and some are good for us and some are not good for us. And so what we look at when we look at self-regulation is the healthy ways of staying within a, a, a range where we don't go too high and we don't go too low. Uh, well. 
in a lot of the work that we do with say children or teens they may have unhealthy ways of self-regulating so I'll give you an example um, we do a lot of work with uh, or I used to do a lot of work with children with autism and they find looking at someone's eyes very stressful and so they respond to that stress which burns a lot of energy by turning away gaze aversion it's called but that's a what we call a maladaptive response to stress because you need to be able to look at your mom or other people in order to learn all kinds of things and it creates all kinds of interesting and important challenges for a therapist or for a parent how can I get my child to self-regulate you know stay in my healthy range without without having negative downstream consequences and so if uh, you and I were talking just before we went live about Mozart in the jungle mm -hmm. and one of the things I find uh, it's a great show uh, very realistic yeah and one of the things I really like about it is how all of the musicians are pretty much all of them they all have um, injuries from repetitive um, uh, you know stress and almost all of them are taking drugs mm -hmm. yeah and drugs is a way of self-regulating, but it's a maladaptive way of self-regulating because it leads to dysregulation down the road. Okay, so then that's your next question. So your next question is, well, what exactly is dysregulation? So for a scientist uh, or a physiologist, dysregulation is when you're no longer in homeostasis, when you're in something called cacostasis, this homeostasis. And what that means is you can't get back into that healthy range. Um, you can't get back into that 17 to 22. You're having trouble. You're constantly going too high or going too low. And you're very erratic. So for the layman, you know, how do we think about it in terms of, you know, explaining this to, say, parents or, in your case, to musicians? What are the signs of this regulation? Well, the easiest one is you can't get back to calm. You can't get back to that stable state. So you find yourself very anxious or constantly having intrusive worries, intrusive thoughts. Um, you can't listen. You can't, uh, you can't make plans, you know, carefully think through what you're gonna do. You become very, very impulsive. So uh, in simplest terms then, when we look at, um, self-regulation versus dysregulation we're looking at techniques and you mentioned a bunch in your questions to me techniques that can help us um, either stay calm or get back to calm when we feel ourselves becoming overstressed yeah okay uh, and dysregulation is where nothing works then we find ourselves turning to something like a like a drug or alcohol whatever because kind of healthy ways to self-regulate, whether it's, you know, meditation or running, whatever it is, don't seem to work. And the second part of your question is, what are the major stresses? And that's a really, really good question and an important question. Usually, when we think of stress, we right away we go to emotional, emotional stresses. And yeah, those are big. Um, Emotional stresses for a musician might be, you know, worrying that uh, you won't um, get into a, a really good band or orchestra or that you'll perform badly or that, uh, um, you know, uh, whatever. But there are other stresses, and you pointed out uh, several of these. So we look at stress across five domains. And the first one we look at is physical stress. So we'll look at things like the obvious ones, uh, you know, exercise, sleep, nutrition. But we have other physical stresses. It could be noise. It could be um, it could be uh, visual noise, which is too much uh, stimulation. Now, that is actually a stress. So the physical domain is sort of your uh, starting point, especially if you're a musician or a musician, when you think about the physical stress that they impose upon themselves. Then we look at emotional stresses. Then we look at cognitive stresses and cognitive stress we won't go into detail here but cognitive stress is actually a very significant factor for a musician 
because for one thing, um, you have to, uh, like I was watching you when you played, and you've set the score up here, but you never looked at it once. Um, so that means that you have chunked an enormous amount of information in your working memory, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's all there, and you play better. Uh, what you were doing is by um, memorizing, in essence, uh, the piece, you were able to devote much more attention to the emotional qualities of how you played it. And so, and you could see how at certain points you became emotionally incredibly expressive. Yeah. But here's the thing about, say, anxiety or those negative thoughts. What negative thoughts do is they start to eat up working memory. So, oh my goodness, that becomes a little trap for the musician because as it eats up working memory, it, it reduces your ability to remember the damn thing that you memorized. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you, you, it's called the dual task. It means part, part of my working memory is going to the bloody thoughts, but now I'm caught in a cycle because now I've got to start looking at my score but, oh no, if I'm looking at my score, then I can't pay attention to the emotional resonance I wanted to create, which creates another stress on me because I know that I am not playing at, the be uh, playing at my best. I'm not doing what I wanted to do. And so as a musician, you can see now, I've got physical stress, emotional stress, cognitive stress, trying to keep all this stuff floating. And now I've further introduced pro-social stress and the pro-social stress is what I want my expectations of myself yeah as, and then finally we have social stress and the social stress is acute for musicians because you're competing with other musicians you are um, if you're performing you're performing um, with uh, a large group that you have to have in a certain mood in order for you to play it their best for them to so, so we have five domains of stress and for a musician okay so physical emotional cognitive social pro-social and for for a musician all five are significant all five are swirling around knocking against each yeah. other okay Stuart yep so let me ask you number two yep uh, in preparation for performance how important is it for someone to understand the concept of demand versus resources in order to prevent dysregulation? Okay, it's a good question. So, um, let's break it down again. Um, this idea of resources, that's an interesting term that you used. I noticed when you said it, and you're quite right. What are these resources? Well, the resources, glucose. That's what you run on. You run on glucose and it runs through your brain and it runs through all your muscles and you're you're making great demands on your muscles and you're concentrating like crazy so you're making great demands on your brain and you're burning through your glucose at a furious rate and that's all you are you're just a glucose machine you just like a car you run but you know one of those ethanol cars you run on corn syrup but now we have a problem because you only have so much glucose. And what your question is asking is, what happens if I'm performing and I use it all up? Does that mean I stop cold? And the answer is no. And the answer is that so we have a backup system. We have an emergency fuel system and it's in our fat cells. They're very interesting, you have very, very low body fat. So you've been tapping into your into your fat cells. So that energy, that it's glucose, it's contained in fat cells. That's real hard to get, and it's there for an emergency. It's not there for playing, you know, Bach. It's there for it's there for an animal's chasing you and you're tired. So how do you unlock that those reserves? Well, we our brain sends a signal, and it's a long chain of events that ultimately secretes cortisol. And what cortisol does is it works 
to like a like a key that unlocks the energy in your fat cells so as you push yourself past your natural reserves your cortisol goes up you need that cortisol in order to in order to tap into your emergency reserves but now we have another problem and the problem is cortisol it was there it was designed by nature uh, for emergency situations cortisol doesn't really feel very good uh, and when we have too much of it it creates a feeling of edginess um, it actually affects our brain in various ways and so what you then get is if you are having this experience of post performance or even post um, uh, practice where you don't feel you don't have that nice feeling of calm mm -hmm. instead you feel on edge the calm if you feel calm after either practicing or uh, or performing it means you stayed within homeostasis if you feel on edge it means you've recruited too much cortisol to push yourself through musicians are incredibly good at pushing themselves well past the point uh, and so many of your questions were about what do I do? And these are good questions. What does a, a music student or a performer or a professional musician do to counteract this neurochemical reaction that we have? And of course, what we're looking at, what you're looking for, are adaptive, not maladaptive. There's lots of maladaptive ways you can do it. You can drink. Um, and what drinking does is it gives you, you're in a very low energy state when you've finished. Alcohol is a form of sugar that's very quickly assimilated. So A, you've, uh, um, A, you have given your uh, depleted energy system a sudden burst. And B, alcohol's got some other nice features too. It has that sedative effect, it uh, dulls emotional distress, etc. But it's maladaptive because it's very, uh, uh, we can become very addicted to it. We are not doing the healthy forms of, of replenishing um, and we become reliant on the, on the um, alcohol or the drug or whatever um, because we can no longer tolerate the kind of um, high cortisol agitation that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm.